All right, so, all right, uh, so I'm on? All right, cool. Uh, hey, everyone, how are you doing today? I want to say hi. My name is Bo Hartman. I'm um, going to do a, a little bit of an introduction. We're going to actually, I'm going to find out where you're at uh, for this conversation today. I want to thank my friend Sam Mall for inviting me at the last minute to come in and go uh, to do this talk. Last. The last minute. But what you'll find out is I love the sound of my own voice, so you're going to love this, all right? Uh, one of the first observations I'm going to totally uh, pick out is that I noticed that you know no one sits in these front rows, so that's kind of like school and high school and others, um, and also in conver uh, conferences. All right, so what we're going to talk about today, before I go into the uh, introductions or the I love me part of, of this presentation, is I want to talk about the blockers that I've seen over the last 30 years of my career. Um, you know, in the payment space or technology as a whole inside of businesses. What I want this to be is a conversation. This isn't going to be me sitting up here pontificating on how incredibly smart I am or all the great experiences. So as we go through this, I am going to interact with you. Now, you get to choose your own adventure as I do this. You can sit there and stare at me and I'll stare back at you and then I'll get to pick you, okay? Or you can say, I want to jump in, because at the end of our time together, I want you to believe that this was a constructive and positive outcome of things that you've shared with the group, shared with me, and I've shared with you that you can go back and actually implement to take forward. Is that a fair agreement between us at this point? I love it. Outstanding. Okay. So um, first off, this handsome fellow uh, is Bo Hartman. Um, this is the part where I talk about the I love me. Actually, it's where I give you my bona fide, so you actually understand I do have some battle scars, and I can talk about this a little bit. Right? So you'll find that my current, uh, my current day job is I'm the uh, co-founder and CTO of a company called Nomi Health. Uh, Nomi Health was started on a PowerPoint deck in 2019, um, and the whole sole purpose of Nomi Health when we launched it was in the United States, we spend four and a half trillion dollars on medical care. I wonder, do you guys recognize that number? Okay, four and a half trillion dollars in the United States alone. Does anybody know how much we spend on defense spending in the United States? One trillion dollars. You nailed it, because <laughs> Jason and I talked a little earlier. Um, One trillion dollars. Number two and number three in the globe, China and Russia, if you add them together, are half a, half a trillion dollars. Right? Now we can argue the numbers are a little higher and lower than that, but that's generally the agreed upon numbers. But we in the United States have the worst health outcomes than any other nation on the world. That's just the data fact. That's just a, a fact. We have the highest mortality for infant. We have the highest mortality from comorbidities like type 2 diabetes, cancer, and others. But we spend four and a half times more than we do on defense spending. And we are the most powerful military nation on the planet in human history. Think about that for a second. So what Nomi Health set out to do was, inside the US medical uh, system, there's this weird thing called direct pay. If you pay a doctor directly, do you know it's actually 40% cheaper? Absolutely. And so the concept was, is how can we set up a payments network that would actually pay doctors in, in real time, because by the way, the other funny thing that happens in the United States is that doctors get paid nine months later and sometimes only at half or 20% of the contracted rate. So think about if you were running your payment business and I told you, we agreed, I will pay you 100 bucks for a transaction, but then when you do the transaction, I then say, you know what, I've decided to pay you a year later for uh, $25. That happens in the US healthcare. So the whole concept was, how do we actually create a network that we pay doctors in real time, and we do that for self-insured employers and for governments and states. Along the way, we got sidetracked with side quests around uh, COVID health. We wrote a charity paper, and that ended up taking care of 15 million people and making over a billion and a half dollars. Um, so now we've gotten back to uh, where we're at. We've launched our own trust company in Nebraska. Uh, we own a pharmaceutical management company, a data analytics company and we're actually pushing to help change the healthcare in the United States. The reason I give you that background is that all industries are payment industries. And I want you guys to think about that as we go through that. Prior to this, uh, I spent over 25 years in international banking. Um, I was at Capital One for 10 years uh, during the golden era, if anyone are familiar with that time period, where we are inventing all new ways to purvey, uh 
consumer debt on the American populace. I'm very proud of that. Uh, and then um, I was then recruited uh, to Barclays. I became the uh, global CIO of Barclays Card International, where I uh, actually ran 45% of the UK payments economy on a daily basis. Uh, as well as other entities. I was regulated across the globe, which by the way, fun fact, if any of you want to be a CIO in the uh, European Union, um, you become civilly liable for any uh, incidents that impact the ability for people to ma make payments. So just, oh, 100%. I was civilly bond in multiple countries. Um, and when they explained that to me, I'm like, I'm not getting paid enough for this. But, um, but after that, I was secretly recruited by uh, Goldman Sachs to build Marcus by Goldman Sachs, which turned into Apple Card. So I am actually literally the dude who built that. I have a fellow OG from Marcus in the back, uh, Jason. He can confirm I was the dude that was actually there uh, who actually um, built that. And it was actually one of the greatest moments. I made partner at Goldman Sachs. And after that, I decided it was too easy uh, making uh, partner money at Goldman Sachs. I decided to become a startup guy. Uh, so, uh, and if. That, that's the, that is literally the lesson. You, you achieve the zenith of your career and you decide, yeah, I'm going to be a startup guy. And like the old saying goes, ever since I've been in the startup world, I sleep like a baby. I wake up several times at night screaming and crying. Uh, so, so those are my bona fides. Okay? So I do have experience. Um, the way that we're going to talk about that is, first off, there are three pieces that I want to actually engage with you guys on. The first piece really is around um, technical overpromises, right? And technical overpromises, we have all seen it. We've talked about the hype curves that you know gardeners put together, and we've all been you know shown the color glossy where our leaders um, are there. Other than Sean or James, are there CEOs in here today? Okay, I'll hug you later. But the CEO will rock up to you and say, "Hey, I just read this article in Wired. We need two of these things, right?" And you're like, "Whoa, <laughs> hold on." So we're going to talk about you know, dealing with the overpromise of technology, but there's actually a good, uh, good story there. One, we're going to talk about regulation. This is where I want to spend a little bit of time in there because as I'm assuming a lot of this is engineers and engineer leadership in here. Yeah, excellent. Um, you guys in the payment space, where you guys are sitting and what you're participating in right now, the policymakers are making this up as they go along, and I'm going to go back to that four and a half trillion dollar market to tell you exactly what I'm doing around regulation. But you're responsible, believe it or not. You might be deploying something, architecting something, or implementing something. You guys are responsible for laying the groundwork for good policy going forward, and it's only going to become more and more important as we move along. And then lastly, the culture of no. How many of you engineer leaders have been frustrated by someone telling you no? Even the CEO, all right? So, so think about that. Even the CEO, the culture of no. I came from a bank uh, that had 145,000 people in it. We used to joke that there was a secret floor on the third level of Canary Wharf, London, where their whole, you couldn't get to it, but their whole division was there just to figure out how to say the words no. I actually left Capital One because I sat in front of my uh, email one day and I highlighted on an email the multiple times it said no or policy and procedure, I highlighted and sent it to my boss and said, I'm sorry, I'm resigning today. I, I can't do this, right? But there are good reasons, and instead of like thinking it's a battle against you, you can actually leverage it. Uh, like I said, torment your captors. All right. Okay. So, so far so good. All right, we're in. All right. So technical promises. So um, I, I'm assuming everybody knows the Gartner hype curve, right? So there's the peak of hype, trough of disillusionment. Uh, and then actually working to where it becomes a usable technology. I'm absolutely going to share an example because it's one of my favorite examples. It's time to trust it as an example before we jump into absolutely uh, the technology that we implemented in Marcus that we actually found out there was a lot of hype around it and it was no silver bullet. All right, so Bluetooth. Bluetooth is ubiquitous in these days the world. We all use it. It, it exists in our lives. Um, uh, Bluetooth was invented in, in the late 80s. Uh, it, uh, around that time. Um, I remember that you really didn't start seeing uh, pushes for it until probably the mid to late 90s of like, hey, Bluetooth's going to change the world. IBM had a big investment in marketing of how it's going it to totally revolutionize the way our cars drive, the way we interact with the world, uh, and then it just disappeared off the map. So this was the peak of the hype of a new technology. No one knew how to use it. It wasn't built. It wasn't at a standard. There was no standard that people could really implement. It was expensive, and we didn't know what to do with it. That was the peak of the hype. Everybody wanted in. Trough of disillusionment. No one used it. 
But then what happened? Creators like you, creators like you, started playing with it. And my friends and my tinkerer friends and my creator friends said, I'm going to play with this thing called Bluetooth. And then what happened? They improved it. They learned what it couldn't do. They learned what it could do. Then you had the hardware nerds step in, and they started tweaking the hardware. And then what happened? It became a viable, viable uh, product. To this day, we cannot get rid of, right? Because it is everywhere, and it does everything for us. And that's that part of that coming through that trough. And it's not a trough of disillusionment. It's actually a trough of invention, a, a trough of creativity, a trough of people actually trying and improving it and see where it works best. And then they can turn around and, and put it into play. And it becomes a system that's out there. I will give you examples of the real world. VR. Do you remember you couldn't turn on CNBC without hearing freaking Jim Cramer talk about VR was going to take over the world? No one talks about it. Apple has whatever, the, whatever that thing is called. $3,000, no one uses it. But I will tell you, I am seeing people here in Austin using it inside of manufacturing and actually being able to walk into rocket engines around them and they can look around. I'm seeing it inside the medical world in labs where the people can look down and they can see all the lab work in front of them and they can go, oh, I know that vial has got this test on it. I know that vial has that test on it and I can move it, uh, they can move it in the physical world as well as seeing it in the reality world. So these technologies will get there. You guys, are you guys familiar with this and you've seen this, this play? Okay, so let's jump into the, the silver bullet thing. So, in Marcus, when I got to Goldman Sachs, they had no consumer bank at all. Turns out they don't have one now anyways, but, but, uh, but they had no consumer bank. One of the reasons that I actually accepted the job offer from them is they said, look, you get to build the digital bank of your dreams the way you want to build it. I didn't believe them. And they said, it's tabula rasa. You tell us how to build it. Now, remember, I'd just been CIO of Barclay Card for four years. At the time, it was a 225-year-old bank. And that means I had systems that were probably developed before I was born. We had, I had 5,000 applications in my ecosystem. I had one called Robin. We didn't know what it did, but we couldn't remove it because someone said it creates a number that gets sent somewhere else, and we don't know what that number does. So we had to keep it running. Okay? So I said, I'm in. I'm going to go build this. Now, here's the secret and the beauty of my architectural dream, middleware. Because my concept up to that point was I had all a bunch of homegrown systems from the 70s and 80s I couldn't do much with. But I was going to use SaaS platforms as far as the eye could see. And the, the golden nugget was I was going to use a middleware to configure, uh, to orchestrate all of it. To the point, by the way, Lloyd Blankfein, the CIO, uh, I mean the CEO of uh, Goldman at the time, would go to investors and going, and I have this genius, and what he's going to do is create a middleware that's going to orchestrate everything. And I'm like, ooh, you might want to back off on that one a bit. But, but the middleware was the secret. And Jason will tell you that, that we told everyone's secret. And we were going to go with the enterprise service bus. Are you guys familiar with uh, enterprise service buses? I actually had the guy working for me who wrote the book that gave the name enterprise service bus. By the way, it came from a beer at ESB. Uh, he was drinking one night, and he looked at ESB, and they came up. They made a name for it. All right. So... 100%. God's on us. Guy named Dave Chapel. God's on us. So, we were going to do this middleware because, as you guys remember, ESB was going to change the world, going to communicate, chat it. We built it. It didn't work. It was too chatty. It overrode each other. We couldn't orchestrate the systems in real time enough that we were getting uh, ill formed messages. It was a depression. So then we decided, ha, beautiful. Microservices. Do you guys remember the microservices phase where everyone thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread? Here's where we do the first interaction part. Who can describe the best microservice or the, the way th that we have been educated to create microservices? Remember, I will voluntold you if you don't participate. Go, man. You nailed it, like perfect. The one thing I was also looking for is uh, there was a thing coming out of Silicon Valley at the time, which is it had to be described in three sentences, right? You guys remember that? Three sentences. We were excited because remember, I ran middleware that was massive, 20,000 connections that did things all over the place. 
So. The, the, oh, 100%. Like, oh, no, do, yeah, Goldman. Yeah, Go, Goldman, two weeks, man. What do you do? Because we were doing, also, we were doing the Agile thing, so two week sprints were like the thing, right? So we went, yes, we want to do that. And we did it. We created a complete mess. Because when you create three sentences to describe a feature that are bringing in uh, 25 SaaS platforms that were never designed to work together, by the way, because they were designed for old banks, in real time, it became a nightmare to manage. It was, oh, it was too much. It was overburdensome. And every time we wanted to make a change somewhere, we had to go across and look at all these different microservices. So then what did we do? We consolidated. And I was sitting in the room the day when we consolidated. I, the guy who is now the CIO of Blackstone who worked for me, literally said, I got great news. And I said, what do you got, John? He goes, we have refactored so it's not too much to manage. And I said, okay, and he goes, we have created a new class of microservice. I said, tell me. And he went, monolithic microservice. And I was stunned. Because what did we just do? Look at everybody, see, like, you're suffering with it right now, aren't you, my man? <laughs> there you are, there's. We turned it around and went from breaking everything apart to make it simple so we could rewrite it quickly so then what do we do? We consolidated it all back up into a monolithic mess to where whenever I needed to make a change, I had to make a ton of changes and a smaller amount. So why is this important where, on where we're talking, right? It's one is there are no silver bullets, guys. I remember talking to Anthony Notu, who was the CEO of Twitter. He was now the CEO of SoFi. He said it took Twitter two and a half years to implement microservices. And what did they learn when they finished? They made a mistake. Everybody made a promise. Now, is microservices not uh, bad? No. You should do them. GraphQL, containers, right? You look like you had someone work with me. Well, it depends really, like everything, right? It depends. But, but your over engineering, if you don't know yet, how to how the landscape is going to be. And it has to be. You want to come up? Cause you want to join me up here, man? Like, because you, you nailed it, right? And and why is that? It's because you brought it into the real world. You experienced it. There's no silver bullet. When I was sitting in those chairs that I talked about, those big chairs, I was leg humped by every vendor on the planet on a daily basis. And we used to call it leg humping, right? I mean, but it's true, because I was Goldman, and they wanted their name in here, right? And they wanted to actually be a part of it. And they all promised me they were going to cure all that ails me. And, and I'm like, no. But what did I do? Where did I go? Real world experiences, right? I literally sat down and I told my teams. And by the way, I started this at, um, I learned this at Cap One and I did this at Barclays. Experiment. Let's grab it. Let's go do it. Let's experiment and let's play and, and try to break it. I would challenge my teams, break it. Because if you break it, you know how, to work, how it works. So does that resonate with you guys? So one, don't believe there's a silver bullet. Don't tell your folks that there's a silver bullet. <laughs> And don't sell a silver bullet. Does not exist. But the thing that I did learn is real world experience. Bring it into the world. Play with it. Practice it. Good. See, see how it works. See how it works. See how it works. Also know how much you're willing to risk, right? Risk reward, right? Risk reward. And, and that's the whole thing is well, how much you want to put on the table. Jason will remember in the early days why, and, and again, Jason can call BS on me, but everyone would come to me and say, Show us where we're going, how we're going to get there. And I would literally say to him, but how much you want to put on the table? Real quick, side quest, then I'll get right back to it again. By the way, is this the right tone and tenor? Is this working for you guys? Oh, sweet, awesome. So total side quest. Uh, anybody, big banks, credit, uh, credit decisioning, know the back FICO and all that sort of stuff? <laughs> Just real quick, your lives are determined by your credit scores. There's three companies that actually do credit decisioning. One of the biggest ones, FICO, OK? Antiquated, old company, but whenever people go, we use alternate data, please no one in here be an alternate data company. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, alternate data, we're going to make your credit decisions based on alternate data. Not true. It's, it's FICO, Experian, it, 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 literally who it is. Um, so uh, I said to get all of you business people off my back, I'm actually going to turn the configuration consoles to you. 
I'm just going to make sure when you make the console changes on the credit decisioning, I'm going to test it before we put it in production. But you're not going to come to me and say, configure our, our tools anymore. It's all you. And all the business people are like, yay, finally. It, and it probably took like a, someone 30 minutes to do it. <laughs> it's, right. And so I turned it to face the business line. I said, good luck with that. And I'm just going to test you for good in production. Four months later, Harit, Harit Tawar, the CEO of uh, Marcus, he was employee number one, I was employee number two, said, I need you to take it back. And I went, oh no, <laughs> like, but why? He said, well, because the business people are just like flipping toggles all over the place. They don't know who used the engineering mindset, the test, methodical, bring it into production. And I just looked at him and I said, my evil plan has come to fruition. I have taught you a painful lesson. <laughs> so total side quest. So cool, you guys make sense. Like, now let me ask you this, do you guys experiment or do you go, yep, this thing's gonna solve the world? By the way, my favorite one right now, GraphQL. GraphQL is gonna solve the world. By the way, I love GraphQL. But it's going to solve everything. Cloud, cloud's going to change the world. Cloud, someone else's server in a different room. That's all it. Right. So, does this resonate with you guys? You nailed it. You absolutely nailed it. So this is one of the biggest things to learn. By the way, that ESB to microservices moved into monolithic microservices. I probably spent eight million dollars on that journey. Eight million. All right. But we got there. We absolutely got there. <laughs> no, that was bad decisioning. Uh, so, all right. All right. Regulation behind the times. Okay. This is where I want to spend a little time. All right. Because. And you might go, well, wait, we talked about a technical implementation. Now we're talking about regulation. Um, so Sam Mall in the back, who talked about uh, his past experience, Sam Mall is one of the, the most brilliant people in, this, um, in the payment space in, you know, in, in, the, in the globe. Um, Jason as well. Uh, his daughter's like, no. I will literally tell you, um, uh, Sam is brilliant, and I love talking to Sam about this sort of stuff. The reason I bring up Sam and I'm going to bring it into with you guys is that he and I agree. You have to understand the things you're building today, the things that you're giving to your clients, the things that are happening, you guys are impacting an industry and we're still not very far down the, the road of digitizing payments in the world. Stunned me when I moved into this industry of medical payments. Do you know the number one way of transmitting data in the health industry organization? Uh, industry in the United States. Oh, you nailed it. Fax machine first, CSV second. CSV second. It is stunning to me. I almost puked when I saw this. Um, it, it, it is, it's, it's, it's stunning. But across the payment industry, we're still moving into that space. Checks, checks are still around. I can't believe it. It is stunning to me that I would, I remember when check 21 came out, like we were gonna be off checks and all the digital moves. So you got, got the ground. If you think the industry is behind from what you guys are doing, policymakers are even behind that. And as a, an example, when I was at Barclay Card talking to the CEO of Barclay Card, her name was Valserana Keating, she wanted me to teach her about technology because she didn't want to be embarrassed when talking about it. So one day we're having a conversation, and I'll get, I'll, I'm going to link this. I asked her a question. Do you think you can code ethics? And she said, no. And, I went, and this was 2012. And I said, um, she goes, no, you can't code ethics. And I said, no, you can. There's somebody right now in Silicon Valley, in Valley creating a social media app who's actually creating the ethics and mores of our society, and we don't even know it. She did not agree with me. We got in a fight about it. I'm standing here in front of you today, I guarantee, I'm telling you right now, social media controls and influences more of our mores and our ethics in our society across the globe than anything else. You can't, you can't make me think anything different. You're doing the same thing. The code you write, the things you put in production, the things you support for your clients are setting the groundworks for the policy impacts that we are going to see in the future. Do you disagree with me? Great. 
Huh? Great, yeah. Great. So now let's actually go into where I want to talk about it. Give you a real life example. February 21st of 2024. Anybody know why that's an important date? <laughs> Not you, Sam. <laughs> Anybody know why it's an important date? Is everyone here American residents or citizens? No, uh, where do you live? Oh, good man. You're safe. Uh, that's okay. So, February 21st is the day that a company called Change Healthcare found out they were taken over by a ransomware account and they shut down all their systems. Anybody know who Change is? Change is owned by a company called Optum, which is owned by United Healthcare. Change is the largest medical billing exchange in the United States. They process over billions, with a B, transactions every year. They process, they claim now after the hack, one third of all medical payments, but before that it was actually somewhere around 80% of all medical payments. Remember that number I gave you, that four and a half trillion dollars? That's change. They are still not processing at full capacity today. This is why doctors were filing for bankruptcy a couple months ago. This is why you couldn't get your, stuff, uh, your medic uh, medicines at the uh, pharmaceutical, uh, the pharmacies. And to this day, doctors are still not getting paid. Okay? Now, you've not heard about this, have you? It's not in the news. Sam Mall and I actually did a podcast about it because I called him up and, uh, and said, hey, man, are you following this? He goes, I saw something last night. And he went, you can't, I'll call you back in 45 minutes. He called me back and went, holy shit. And I went, yeah. So I've been spending a lot of time on Capitol Hill talking about this because they didn't even know. The challenge that we have is Change Healthcare, which is a small little company that bought up a bunch of other companies because it was owned by a PE firm, became national critical infrastructure for medical payments. National critical infrastructure, processing trillions of dollars. And when Change went down, because they were de facto the MasterCard Visa backbone in the United States, everything else collapsed around it. There were really no secondaries. There, there, there's things like Waystar and Avail, Availity, but if you picked up enough rocks, guess who they were connected to? Change. They needed change to function. Right? Now, they have stumbled into... Oh, right. Availity is built on top of change. They are competitors. But, when, but if you're a massive hospital system in the Northeast region, you're connected not to... Availability and change, you're connected to change, which then connects to availability, and that's how they process. Availability before, by the way, before February 21st, availability's market share was like that big. Change was like that big. A national piece of payment infrastructure was built over 10 to 15 years. We didn't know about it. Do you know who did know about it? The Russians, Black Cat. And they have been testing the American medical system for over a year. And on the February 21st, they decided, pull the trigger. And they pulled the trigger, and some poor person clicked on an email that took down the American medical payment system. Google Mandy made a fortune. <laughs> yeah. Still making a fortune, right? Yeah. So the reason why I tell you guys all this, to lay that groundwork, to now talk to you, did you think that those people over the 10 to 15 years hammering away on their code thought they were building national critical infrastructure? Not even close. Not even close. And they built it. And when they were attacked and it has gone down, I went to, um, oh, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry that you guys are witnessing my, I have travel time. Uh, um, I'm done with you. I'm going to stay with you. Don't worry. We're here, baby. Um, so I am screaming down the hallways of like, this is insane. I can't believe people are not losing their minds over this. Our government relations organization is really well connected. And they said, hey, we would like to get you and talk, talk with some senators and representatives and lay it out. Because what I did, and actually was talking with Sam, I said, there are frameworks in the banking world, because this industry, by the way, is shadow banking. It 100% is shadow banking. It, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a freaking duck. Um, and I said, look, there are already frameworks that banks have to live up to of protecting infrastructure. And we have to report out. Remember those two roles of Goldman and Barclays I told you about? I had to sit every quarter in front of our internal auditors and our regulators and talk about my team's uh, performance reports. 
the risk that I was carrying. I sat on multiple risk committees inside the firm. I had to tell the regulators what I invested in and why I invested in and how come I chose to invest in this and not that. I had to defend my positions on a regular basis. This industry, not at all, completely silent. And so I said, look, let's take the examples in the framework that exist in the banking space and let's implement it here. All of them literally looked at me and said, I don't know how medical payments are happening. I'm like, you sit on the medical committee in the Senate. Your staff are PhDs from John Hopkins on health policy, and you don't know how payments are made? Like, no, no, we worry more about community health and stuff like that. And I said, this is a four and a half trillion dollar market. You spend more time yelling at the Boeing and Raytheon CEOs than you do at the United Healthcare CEO that it is control of more of the US economy than they are. They were all stunned, all stunned, because a group of men and women over decades of period were hammering out code that became national critical infrastructure. Now, why do I tell you the story and why I want you to walk away with this one? Is because what you're doing today, you might not go, oh, that's kind of grandiose and I'm not. No, but you have to think about it. The other thing you have to do is get involved with your local policymakers. They don't understand this, but they do want to learn. Your local state representatives, your local um, uh, House representatives, your senators, believe it or not, they want to get involved. I sat with the Senate Banking Committee and said, you know, you can help the Health Committee by using these frameworks. They were overjoyed because they, they themselves did not make the connection. I said, this is a money movement. After you talk to a nurse or a doctor and they hit the enter button on an uh, electronic health records system, it is no longer a health matter. It is a payments transaction. That has taken, gotten legs. There are multiple letters going off to change uh, to United Healthcare, and in my 10-point plan that I actually laid out for them, which, by the way, was just me kind of going, "This is the stuff I used to have to do." Several senators who pinned the letters out, cut and pasted things like infrastructure spend, risk management. My personal favorite, by the way, which upset um, the CEO of United, uh, which I know for a fact, uh, Andrew Whitty. I said, "Ask." What risk committees approved the $12 billion acquisition of Change Healthcare? $12 billion, and knew about these infrastructure uh, deficiencies. Ask who chaired them and get their performance reviews. They did. And they lost their minds. Because guess what? When I was at banks, they used to ask me, let me see your performance management system and show me the people that are sitting in these roles. Show me how you rank them. Can you also expand on the fact that premiums are still being paid? Oh, <laughs> this is my personal favorite. <laughs> this is my personal favorite. Okay. At 12%. So, so this is my personal favorite. I literally told the Senate, I said, I smell bailout coming. They said, there's no way a bailout's coming. Two days later, United said, hey, we're going to do this emergency loan program, which I'm like, I smell a senator making a phone call somewhere. My personal favorite, though, is I said, hey, do you guys understand that the self-insured employers are still sending billions of dollars on a daily basis to United Healthcare? It's sitting in their bank accounts. They're creating float, but they're not paying doctors or hospitals. I had the, a couple of senators go, what is float? I'm like, oh. <laughs> I'm a knuckle-dragging banking monkey. Let me tell you about float. Uh, so yes. So again, I want you guys to think about whether you, you think you're not having that impact or not. You are creating the infrastructure, which is critical going forward. Real quick on to close this piece out. If you noticed, airline systems go down, CrowdStrike does a bad rollout, globally destroyed travel for several days. Hundreds of millions of dollars just to Delta, billions across the industry. National critical global infrastructure and nobody thought about it. I'm telling you right now, it's gonna become a big, big thing in the coming years. I know because I am going back to DC to sit down with the, the Capitol Hill to talk about how do we actually think about national critical infrastructure and how do you deem it. So think about that's the role you wanna play. Is that good? Like, did that help? Did it make you think a little bit? Any uh, ideas coming from you guys as you're thinking about it? A little puckering? <laughs>
Um, and, and this is actually what I, I, I've been working with um, policymakers. You notice I say policy, not regulation, right? Because you know the, the word regulation, some and some people causes organ rejection, right? Um, but yeah, the, the horse is out of the barn, right? But policy, policy is the goods. You know, to say um, first off, when a policymaker works with private industry, because I am a free market man. Um, Policymakers work with uh, the free market in saying, look, we are going to hold a standard because we are an objective observer in this situation. We're going to hold that standard. And then private industry informs that standard. Look, I've been regulated more than nuclear power plants. And I've had bad regulation where I went, this is horrible. But then I had, you know, go, that's fair regulation. <laughs> fair enough, right? So, but I've also sat with the policymakers and I said, look, here are the things that we need to be held accountable to a standard, and your job as objective, hold us to that standard, right? And then, if you notice, it's a slow moving iceberg, because we're not gonna change this overnight, but it's a slow moving iceberg to where, what happens though, is when those standards are set in and we're held to those standards, the industry moves that way. I'll give you a real life quick example. In 2012, when I was uh, at Barclays, as the CIO of Barclay Card, um, NatWest, the bank in the UK, um, they did a mainframe upgrade. The team that did the mainframe upgrade in India left after they did the upgrade. It melted the entire mainframe. The next morning I woke up, all transactions were done. There were no credit card transactions, there were no AECH, there was no ATM transactions, nothing. Everything disappeared. I thought we had been attacked. Then I found out it was across the industry. People's mortgages were bouncing, their rent wasn't paid, they couldn't buy petrol. Banks were not clearing between each other so that companies could make payroll. Completely hole in the ground. The UK government then came back and they said, uh, we're gonna implement something called Dear Chairman Letters. There are two of them, Dear Chairman One, Dear Chairman uh, Two. And what that was is they laid out very specific standards in, in uh, explaining risk management. They didn't tell you how to do it. They said, we're gonna hold you to the standard of risk management. Uh, risk management. We're gonna hold you to the standard to uh, infrastructure investment. We're gonna hold you to the standard of how you manage your organization. And then they identified, I think it was 50, 50 economically critical business processes. And then they had to assign an executive from each bank to each one of those. I had to. Every year I had to sign, personally on a piece of paper, that would go to the chairman of Barclays, which would then go to the head of FSA in the UK, that said, I am personally guaranteeing that I have done to the best of my abilities of these things. That's good policy, right? And that's what we need to do. But the policy has to be educated and informed, and that's why Folks in this room, get, get involved in those, those local committee things to help formulate good pro, uh, policy. Because when regulators are left to their own devices, it could be punitive, and so you have to engage. And you might think, well, my company maybe might be too small. It's not, because they need the help, the policymakers. They need the education, they need the engagement, and good policy goes. Also, you learn a lot. Like you learn their perspective, where they're coming from, and that and that sort of stuff. Cool. Um, I know I'm pressing up against time, so but very good dialogue. I'll jump to the next piece. All right, excellent. All right, so this is the the last one. Culture, no, and I, I was going to be pretty quick on this one. Um, so one of the things, and I'm going to kind of shortcut it so we can make it on time. Um, one of the things that I uh, I love is like I told you that third floor and Canary Wharf of the Department of No, right? But the Department of No wasn't built, people don't wake up every day and go, hey, I got a great idea, I'm gonna ruin everyone else's day. Like, they just don't do that. What they do do is they say, look, we have seen something bad happen in the past. Uh, Overpromise of technology, not following good policy, not putting good risk ma management in place. Those things take place, and all they are is, I call them the immune system. The immune system's just trying to protect the entity from stupid. Um, or curiosity, 
right? Hey, what does this do? Um, and so that is what the culture of no is. It's just, it doesn't mean to be. It's just trying to take care of itself. It's trying to protect it. And when I went to Barclays, during my interview process at Barclays, I was told that I'd be joining the worst group and the worst organization. They weren't wrong, by the way. Um, but it wasn't because these were bad men and women. It was because the Department of No had beaten them down so much, they had lost their curiosity, and they lost, they lost their excitement of how to solve the problem. Every organization has a culture of no. Every organization does. I do not care who you are or where you're from, there is a culture of no. But here's the thing, as engineering leaders in this, in this or, uh, uh, room, I'm gonna tell you how to get past the culture of no. Here's how you get past the culture of no. Instead of fighting with the department of no, or the immune system, you actually look at your teams and yourself and going, the more constraints that are implemented on me, makes the problem more interesting. It does. I see you smiling, right? It, it, it happens, right? That, that's, and, and, and when you look around at yourself and your team and you challenge them, regulation, by the way, heavily regulated, you can't do that, that's against the law. Is it? Let's actually talk about that. Let's break it down. And as you start pulling it apart, you go, the intent of the regulation is not to do these bad things or to have these bad outcomes. So if I know that, then what is the outcome we're going to get? What is the outcome we're going after? And then using those constraints to make the problem very, very interesting. I'll give you a real life example. OK. So um, when we were building Marcus, we were told that we had to collect all of these documents and we had to do all of these things in a prescribed order. Uh, credit checks, we had, to do, uh, we had to get right documents, we had to check to make sure the documents were, were clear. But we said to ourselves, well, and, and by the way, before we even told somebody how much money we'd lend to them, because we had an installment loan side of the house, um, we had to make sure we did all the final credit decisioning. But we actually thought about it differently. Because normally banks think about, I want to make a loan to make money. By the way, we want to make money. That's totally cool. But what we said is, actually, <laughs> what we want to do is we want to find out how much people can afford to pay back. We changed the question slightly. Not how much risk are we putting the bank at. We was like, how much can you pay back? So in the original uh, implementation of the installment loans of, on Marcus, you went in, we asked you two questions. How, like Jason's laughing. How much can you pay back a, a month? And how much money do you need? Two questions. Then we ask for four pieces of data. Your name, your address, uh, uh, two other pieces. And then we did a soft pool. And we gave you three options inside that framework that said, hey, you said you can pay $200 back a month. You need it $10,000. If you want to do 225, we can do this, this interest rate. So on and so forth. Actually, what we did is we created 21 different options. You just didn't see it. And then you moved the sliders. And then we popped it forward. Um, people loved it. And then the second thing we said is we do not want the people to get off their couch. We don't want them to get off the couch. We want them to be able to sit down, shop, make a decision, scan a couple things in, and go. We were told you can't do that. What we did is we looked at the regulation. We looked at what the, what the client needed. And what we did is we went through and we said, first off, we can do a soft pull. We can make a decision off of that. Credit decision, very simple. And not until they say, I want this, and they're about to sign documents, do we do the hard pull? Because um, in the credit world, if you do a hard pull on someone's credit report, it actually does hit them, right? Um, so at that point, we hadn't had no penalties against the individual yet. But the way that installment loans works in the United States before that is we would penalize you. As soon as you ask for a loan, we would do a hard pull, and that would literally hit your credit report whether you finish the process or not. And we're like, we don't want to do that. So we looked for, we, we had regulators, and we, well not regulators, we had internal audit who just said no to everything we did. And I said, let's make the problem more interesting. How do we make it so that this person doesn't get off the couch and that we're not telling them what they can have, they're telling us what they need. And then from there, we will stay within good policy, we'll stay in good risk management, and we'll come up with an answer so that when they do hit the button, they feel like they were co-creating 
the loan and the outcome for us. And it had an impact. It absolutely had an impact. So does that, does that land with folks? Do you, do you actually see where that plays in your day-to-day -day life and your work? Cool. All right, so I am a few minutes over my time, but I'm actually very happy to take any questions, any pushback, any thoughts, criticisms, accolades, I do love accolades, or anything of the sort. Cool. All right. Well, first off, I want to thank you for you guys giving me your time. It's the most valuable thing that you, that you have in your uh, wallet. Um, I would say tackle Jason and Sam in the back because these guys know their stuff. Uh, and if you have a chance, they're uh, a founder and a CEO of one of the most interesting companies in Austin e-commission uh, e over here. Uh, they have this really great little payment thing going on. Uh, but <laughs> grab them and talk to them about that. And if you ever um, have any questions, reach out. Thank you, guys. Appreciate your time. <laughs>